Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and uh, yeah, we're going to continue this little series. So yesterday we talked about Drozov's campaign. This was a campaign that I streamed for a total of 30 hours over on twitch.tv slash the Great Book of Grudges. You might want to pop by, say hello, we're streaming more Zatan today. But today we're going to be talking about Zatan as I've been able to play as Zatan and Astrogoth with my own time prior to the embargo drop. So I've got a decent grasp on them. And I want to give you my general thoughts because while they don't have their own unique mechanics, they can actually play quite different due to their location, their first possible enemies, and a few other things. So sit back, relax, and let's talk about Zatan the Black, a character that I've been waiting to join the Total War Warhammer series for quite some time now. So one thing I've actually heard from a lot of the community is that Zatan has very lackluster faction lord effects, and yes, they could be a lot to be desired, however, I will say that the benefit of having an extra convoy at the very start is actually very good. You'll also have one more convoy than all other Chaos Dwarf factions. This means that while you're not really producing as many resources as all the other factions, you are getting more variety, and you will be able to get caravans a lot stronger from the early game onwards, which does actually benefit you in the later game, depending on how you play. There's also the thing of getting more casualties from post-battle with Zatan himself, which means that you'll be able to get a decent amount more labor. Remember that you can also enslave the captives to turn them into more labor. Again, I know, not very exciting, but hear me out, it will make sense as we go into the campaign. In terms of start position, you're actually starting pretty close to the corner of the map. This means that you have one of the more secure factions, as you're mostly focusing to your left, to your right, and obviously to your south. Nothing is coming to you from your north, which means that you're going to be a bit safer, but keep in mind that, um, yeah, this is still an aggressive campaign. You're playing as a Chaos Dwarf, and many factions have at least minus 20 aversion to you, all the way up to minus 100. Yes, minus 100, it's quite brutal. Now, before we jump into the campaign map, we can talk about a few things. You see, here, there's a few ways that you can expand. To your left, you really don't want to go to, because Kolek is over there, and he actually has decent diplomatic relations with you. You just have to start and just pretty much keep that going and you're safe, you're secure. The majority of the Chaos Factions will really not want to attack you unless you give them a reason to. Generally, Kolek will also move into the Mountains of Morn too or further into the Old World for some reason, but you're safe there. To your right, you have Village, which is taking over a lot of territory and is probably an enemy that you will want to actually kill. There's also some minor Chaos Factions there, like a Norskin Faction, another Chaos Warrior Faction, one with which you'll be actually at war with, and they're clearly an enemy that you'll want to deal with at the beginning. Secure yourself at the right and that gives you three provinces to kind of build up and build up your base of operations. Now, through the Mountains of Morn, you have Grimgore, which eventually is going to declare war on you, and like with all the other Chaos Legendary Lord factions for the Chaos Dwarves, you will likely have your caravans being sniped out by Grimgore. Greasus is also an issue, and then you have Grand Cafe, which is going to expand that way and eventually expand into your territories too, though they will be a bit more passive about moving into the Northern Chaos Wastes. You're a bit more restricted, but that means that if you can go down into Cafe and eventually just take that over and also the Mountains of Morn, you basically get yourself a nice chunk of the world map, with your allies Drazoof and Astrogoth actually just kind of acting like a bit of a buffer for you until you decide to confederate them. So back into the campaign map, you just have to push yourself right. And the benefit that Zatan has over pretty much the other two Chaos Dwarf factions is that you can run a lot of Hobgoblins very, very early. So what you'll want to do is start taking over locations and building up the Hobgoblin building to be able to get the quest trigger for Gordo's Backstabber from the very beginning. Yes, you can get this at turn one, which means that by turn two, you can actually have Gordo's Backstabber. There's a few reasons why you actually want to do this. The fact is that, yeah, Hobgoblins are always going to work, but there's a few buildings that will also kind of make things easier for you. The fact that you can also recruit four units instead of three, as Zatan himself can recruit one extra one, means that you're going to be able to get an army up and running. Again, turn three, and this is where you start stacking up bonuses. So, there's a lot of different things that you can do to reduce the upkeep of the hobgoblins. At the very beginning, you can get that from tech trees, and you can start getting it there, boosting them up as much as possible, because you're going to have a lot of hobgoblins. The difference between, say, Zatan and Drozoth and Astrogoth is that you're going to be able to swarm very, very heavily, as there's a lot of ways to just mitigate your upkeep to the point that you're going to have 
very early on, two, three, four armies, all of them of hobgoblins. Yes, not the most exciting units, but it means that you're going to conquer very quickly. If you want to build tall, this is the faction to do so. So you're able to reduce the upkeep of all your hobgoblins by 10% with just that tech that you can get in two turns. Then when you get the landmark, which is available to you at tier three, it's actually not too far away, you're able to pick up an extra 15% reduction for all your armies, while also increasing their recruitment uh, rank and also reducing their recruitment cost. This is faction-wide bonuses. So you can see that you've already got a lot there. To minus 25% is actually quite high, which means you'll be able to challenge Cafe's numbers quite easily. Now, another reason why your campaign might feel easier here is because you've got some diplomacy options. Kolik is right next to you and he likes you already. What you want to do is sort out a non-aggression pact and then later on, after about a turn or two, he'll like you a bit more and then you can get the military access. This means you don't have to fear too much. He'll expand a little bit, but keep in mind that even he can't deal with Grimgor, so you're eventually going to have to deal with Grimgor. Grimgor is uh, a little bit of a problem right now. He's very, very hyper-aggressive, which obviously works. It's very thematic, it's very law-friendly, and it fits with the whole Chaos Dwarf aesthetic that you're going to have to deal with the big green machine. But until you can do that, you might as well make sure that you have a very big friend in the form of a Dragon Ogre. Keep in mind, too, that sometimes Archeon might kill him, because the Chaos factions will end up fighting for the Dark Fortresses, hence why you also want to get rid of Village, by the way. Like I said before, the big benefit that you do have compared to the other Chaos Dual factions is that from turn 5 you have access to two convoys. Here I got quite lucky with some RNG and got Ogre Controller, which means that I might actually make some friends out of the Ogre factions. Not so much Greasus, as Greasus will become very good friends with Zhao Ming, but the rest of them will kind of be kind of passive. The benefit of having two convoys means that you can get different types of materials very early on if you want to go for some labor but also want to get some cash by selling some armaments or whatever or you can also work on diplomatic relations so i can then send down a convoy down to greases to try and make some friends with him or even ghost as ghost does tend to expand so you've got a lot more diplomatic bonuses when it comes to convoys remember there is a little bit of diplomacy involved here Unlike the other Chaos Dwarf factions, what you'll want to do is actually funnel all your labor at the beginning to the Stone Sky foothills, as that means that you can get some cash flow directly by selling some labor and also build up everything that you might need to to get to tier 3 quickly. You'll notice that I also focus very heavily on making the other settlements there focus around getting raw materials, because your main way to upgrade is labor and raw materials. Armaments can come later. You won't really need them too much when you're busy swarming with a bunch your gobbos. Remember, hobgoblins might be a trash tier unit, but they actually work out quite well. So when you upgrade them, when you've got a lot of tech focused around them, you're going to be able to be just quite destructive. This means that you'll be catching out many of these factions early on whilst they still have trash tier units, but you've got your better trash tier units essentially. And it's because of that that by turn 8 you can actually start fighting village. If you wait a decent amount of time, he will always go to the dragon crossroads, which means just recruit, wait, and then snipe him as soon as he tries to take it, he does take it, or he starts sieging it. He'll be killable. By that point, you were already gotten a few levels with Gordas, making him stronger, making your other goblins stronger, save up your skill points to make sure that you can just get him to boost up your goblins as much as possible, and watch as your hobgoblins start becoming very, very strong. You will have to fight the other minor faction there, which is a Norskin faction, but if you take out Village first, you'll be fine. In some cases, he'll go straight and take out the Dragon Crossroads again, but yeah, you've taken out his main settlement, you've taken out his main cash flow, that point he won't really be too much of an issue and you can just play cleanup. Again with the Tower of Tsar you'll want to focus on the industry section, more than likely focusing around raw materials. Your big hurdle at the start of your campaign is getting your main settlement up to tier 3 and then you're pretty much golden from there. There's other things to go for and obviously this might differ from player to player because you know different playstyles and so on but I feel like this is generally the best way to go. And by around turn 20 what you will see is you've conquered the three main areas in the the Northern Chaos Waste. You've also gotten the Great Bastion, which has pretty bad uh, garrisons, if I may say so myself. But the idea is you've got a protection against the Cafean factions. Here is when you can start deciding where to go. If you want to go down and deal with Cafe, which might be a smart idea, as you are aware that Lokia also expands, and Lokia will harass you a lot if you let him expand too much. 
Grimgore is also, as you can see, expanding. This is very average for Grimgore. He'll start moving down and he'll also start moving a little bit up. He'll start fighting his way into the actual Darklands too, but the main thing is he will start to harass your convoys. You're going to have to deal with him eventually. You at this point are more than able to field more than one army. As you can see, I've actually got two armies up and running, two at the Great Bastion, one which is uh, Zatan with his actual Hobgoblin army. We've then got another Hobgoblin army and I am tempted here to build up a third to start protecting my area. I could very much leave a cheap labor army at the Stone Sky Foothills, but eventually Grimgore is going to have to be taken out. You're going to have to defend here but if you decide to expand fairly quickly into cafe, you might actually get some cash. Take out the dragon children before they become too much of a problem. As you know, they are very, very strong. And go from there. Again, very much dependent on your playstyle. And from there, it's up to you. See, this is the remnants of my stream yesterday on twitch.tv slash the Great Book of Grudges. We will be continuing this campaign later today. Uh, actually, by the time this video goes live, we would have already started this. Uh, as you can see, I started pushing into the Mountains of Morn because Grimgor was becoming too much of a problem. I fought Zhao Ming. He and Greece have started pushing up, but I needed to take them out. Uh, we've also had a bit of an issue with Drazov basically dying out to Imric, so I started pushing down there. As you can see, I confederated with Zar Nagrund, and the idea was go and help Drazov so I can eventually confederate him. Now, you can still confederate him even if his faction's dead, but I want some territory, and I'd rather not have to build up new territories when I can easily have some other factions do so. Astrogoth has started pushing into Kislev and did lose some territory as he decided to start fighting both Kolek and Archeon, but I'll let them handle that for themselves. I don't really need that problem right now. As you can see, I'm also pushing directly into Cafe. Lokir is dead. Lokir was killed by Nakai, which is absolutely bizarre. I've never really seen that happen before. Even Kogath managed to kill off uh, Ghost, which is, again, very, very strange. But the main thing is I am pushing into Cafe. I'm pushing into the Mountains of Morn. As I'm in the corner, you can see it's a lot easier for me to push in multiple locations at once and not worry about anything. So, yeah, I would say that... Uh, uh, Zatan probably has the easier campaign. I did take a while because we were memeing about, we were talking a lot of lore. The idea is, like, you know, these streams are just, like, a bit for fun. But it's very clear that Zatan the Black has the easiest Chaos Dwarf campaign if you want to build tall and you want to have a bit more of a relaxed one rather than being surrounded on all sides and being basically fighting constantly. But with that being said, let me know what you guys think about this in the comments below. Let's start a bit of a discussion. Again, we'll be streaming on today. There's a bunch more videos still to come. Uh, we'll be kicking up the speed a little bit as from, I think, tomorrow. And uh, soon, the Chaos Dwarfs will be with you and you get to enjoy your time with your factions. But yeah, have a nice day, guys. And I'll see you all again very, very soon.